Hey, what's going on folks and welcome to, well, the news playlist. We're gonna get to this in a moment here, but I wanna go ahead and just take you front and center screen here and welcome you. Again, my name is Mike, if you're just joining the channel here. And today I'm gonna to be talking about a few different updates that have been requested for this channel. And well, we're gonna try them out. I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. We're gonna still do a lot of technical stuff here. And this will just give me a venue to give you a bunch of exciting updates. So uh, this is what we're talking about here, the June 24 updates here. <laughs> we're going to be talking about courses, uh, training, live stream stuff, because, well, the people have asked and I have answered. So we're going to go ahead and demonstrate the format for you. But I first want to talk about some of the exciting things that are coming up in the channel. I think that'll be something useful for you to learn. We're going to look at some cool stuff. And anyways, uh, so let's go ahead and start off with some updates from things going on. Uh, I'm going to be giving some on-site training at CppCon at their CppCon Academy. So this is going to be a workshop that takes place at the start of the conference. I'll put the link below. Uh, and if you're interested in doing some modern C++ training and learning the essentials of well, C++ 11 through 20, we'll even touch on a few 23 things uh, in this training here. Uh, this could be a great uh, workshop for you to attend. So if you are in the US, if you're going to be in Denver and Colorado in the September timeframe, uh, come join me, come join me on site. Uh, could be a good excuse for you to have your company send you and do some training um, and, you know, learn with some other like minded folks. I know we've already got a few folks registered, so uh, feel free to uh, join in the fun here. So anyways, you can read through the uh, description and the syllabus and that should give you a good idea of what you're going to be learning. Now, if you can't uh, join me in uh, training here, uh, in the uh, CppCon Academy. Of course, we've got on the courses.mshaw.io um, site here uh, some courses. So if you're more just starting with C++, this is probably my course that I'd recommend to you uh, if you just want to, again, do this at your own pace. I've recently added a bunch of supplemental materials in the text here so you can see the free stuff that you're already seeing on YouTube here and build a fun little image loading project. And I have a few updates planned for this uh, coming up soon. So feel free to check that out. Uh, the other announcement that I want to make on this channel as far as courses go, the hands-on debugging course has been added to Udemy. Uh, that's going to be the only one for now. Um, you know, because uh, folks asked for it, uh, essentially. Um, so I wanted to at least have one of the courses on Udemy. Um, and uh, debugging is something that I feel is very, very important for developers. So uh, there you go. You can uh, learn some debugging skills. Feel free to pick it up uh, on courses.msha.io or Udemy, uh, one or the other. Just pick the one that's the cheapest price or the platform that you like best. Um, no problem uh, for me here. Uh, and then otherwise, uh, nothing changes as far as courses or trainings. There's going to be a ton of YouTube videos um, still coming out here. Uh, and I do have my YouTube library that I did want to just mention to folks um, that if you haven't seen this link, I like using it and just doing control F searching for something like span, or maybe if you're more into like delaying stuff, uh, you could search for that and you'll find conference talks, uh, videos that I've done. They're all here on one page. Uh, I like to be able to just grab or search through stuff. And sometimes you can't do that as easily on YouTube. So anyways, uh, that's something that we, uh, that I've been working on and I, and I update this every few weeks so that it has most all the videos here. Okay. So feel free to check that out just as another service here. Um, already, so a few things that have come up here uh, from various folks, uh, the request to do more live streams and talking about stuff. So uh, for instance, the programming language first impressions series, I'm going to consider doing a live stream of that. Uh, that should be fun. It'll be an hour. Uh, I don't know exactly when, or maybe we'll have a regular schedule. I just got to figure out when I'm free. <laughs> but if you see me going live, feel free to join in. It should be a lot of fun. And uh, I'm going to just do my regular thing and then you can see how uh, I learn things. Uh, the other thing that I want to do a little bit more live of is looking at technical articles um, and programming related content, tech stuff, tech stuff that's going on in the world, because I think that's relevant to all of us. Um, so for today, as an example, I pulled out a blog that I've been meaning to read and I thought we would just go through it together. So uh, anyways, folks, with that said, let's go ahead and just take a look at sRGB and linear color spaces. Um, and the reason I picked this up is because recently I was looking at my monitor. I have two monitors side by side uh, and the colors were looking different. So this is sort of relevant because you have to know, um, for instance, um, when you buy a monitor, how to fine tune it. I mean, this is especially important if you're a digital artist. You, you probably already know these things, like the colors that you're drawing, how are those actually 
uh, going to appear in the real world if you print them out and so on. So uh, anyways, I thought color spaces were kind of an interesting one, and this was a nice little short blog. Um, and I'm a big fan of uh, game engines, graphic engines. I do a lot of graphics work. That's where some of my professional work's been. Um, so I was looking at Ultra Engine because I found this probably a month or two ago on a blog. So yeah, almost a month ago. Um, and I think this was tweeted out by maybe Josh himself here. Um, and I stumbled upon this. So um, anyways, I thought this was a nice short article and I wanted to just finally read it so I could take it off uh, my phone. <laughs> so anyways, let's dive into it. Uh, so anyways, on uh, sRGB and linear color spaces. So he's starts, recently I came across a problem where HDRI images I loaded and converted into cube maps look simultaneously too bright and too dark. Okay, so HDRI, high quality images. Uh, a cube map is sort of what it sounds like. Imagine a cube and then you paste images on all six sides. Uh, if you go inside of that cube or sample from it uh, in the graphics world, that's how in a game or something you have a sky. You're in this just giant cube, you know, textured with a sky. Uh, but of course, if it looks too dark or too bright, that's going to look kind of weird or, you know, change the atmosphere in the game here. Um, so he says, I found that a simple linear to sRGB conversion made the images look as I would expect. Okay, interesting. Uh, now, this is quite a difference here. Like, here, let's zoom out just so you can see both of those. Like, one is definitely, like this one here, like the sun is super bright, this stuff's super dark. Uh, and this looks more like we perceive in the real world, this image here. So that, that's kind of neat. Interesting observation. Uh, let's zoom in a little bit more. Uh, so I've read about sRGB and linear color spaces before, but for some reason this time it just clicked and I understood. Okay. Uh, maybe since I'm no longer dealing with a low-level Vulcan nonsense, I have extra mental capacity to spend on more high-level concepts like this. Yeah, the Vulcan stuff's tough because, um, right, it's very low-level graphics API, so um, now, of course, if folks want to learn graphics programming, we have OpenGL stuff on this uh, site here. And I like OpenGL. It's a good, you know, level of abstraction. But Vulkan, you're more, you're kind of writing the, the driver and how all the commands are set and, and setting things up here. Uh, eventually, I'd like to get into more Vulkan stuff um, on this channel with lessons. But um, <laughs> as, he, as he's stating, um, it, it does sometimes take more capacity. So... Uh, in any case, I find this stuff is usually not explained very well, and I want to show you how it works in simple terms everyone can understand. Great. Uh, the basic idea of sRGB color space is that the way we perceive lightness in an image is wrong. Look at the gradient below. The change in the leftmost 25% of the image looks much greater than the change in the rightmost 25%, but it's not. Yeah, I mean, this looks like a really dark patch here, but, uh, you know, this is kind of going linear here. Our brains kind of perceive things interesting. If you've ever done any of these, like, illusion tests or you know, the classic um, blue and black dress versus the gold and white dress thing, right? How we sort of perceive colors is a whole interesting science. Um, so, okay, so this is probably how we get like these dark patches and so on. Uh, so a long time ago, photography folks all agreed that these types of gradients look wrong. You will often see this as uh, referred to as crushed blacks, uh, the opposite of overexposed bright colors, and it's usually considered to be a bad thing. Okay, so good black versus the crushed black here. Yeah, it kind of makes sense. I mean, this is very, um, since you're getting all the colors kind of grouped to the left here, this becomes, the, the contrast doesn't exist there. Here it does. You can see the individual features of the rocks. So yeah, that's interesting. Uh, in 1996, HB and Microsoft came up with an equation that makes a gradient look right. Um, interesting. I wonder, okay, so we could go into the sRGB uh, article here. Yeah, interesting. I wonder if this was just empirical. Uh, like, again, it just looks right or good enough. Yeah, and this is for uh, gamma. Um, so sometimes we call this like gamma correction uh, in, in graphics world. Um, okay, so this is called the sRGB color space. Um, I remember folks used to refer to this as like the special RGB. I don't know. sRGB, I think it's just the, let's see, do they define sRGB here? Red, green, blue, color space. Um, maybe someone could comment below here. I just remember folks referring to it as that here, but let's see here. Uh, I don't see what the S stands for. Oh, I can, I'll Google that. Oh, all right, let's do this. We're doing our pretend live stream. Standard, okay, so standard, red, green, blue. Okay, interesting, yeah. 
buy again. Yeah, 1996. Article from Tom's Hardware. Okay, good stuff. Um, and basically what this color space does is it just shifts the darker tones to the right with a simple equation. The resulting gradient below looks more balanced, even though it's really unbalanced. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I mean, this looks, I mean, to our eyes, this looks better. This looks much like smoother. Uh, and this is, I guess, what we're more perceiving in the real world, right? You don't look at a cliff off in the darkness. You know, I don't know how far away this is, but maybe it's like 20 meters or something. And it's totally like dark, uh, the crushed black, <laughs> right? So that's what your film or digital camera is capturing versus something on the uh, right side. Uh, let's see. So the only problem is that since these colors are stretched, all our... Uh, nice neat color math is no longer valid. Multiplying two colors together like we do for lighting won't produce the right result because the colors have been shifted to the right by varying amounts. Okay, so this is like the, the game dev part. How do we fix this? Uh, so the solution is to unstretch all colors by converting from sRGB to linear, perform your color math like lighting, and then shift the result back from linear to sRGB. Okay, so you do all your math in linear and then you stretch things out. Uh, fortunately, you won't have to modify your textures and colors because sRGB is considered the correct value that we want to see, and linear color space is a temporary intermediate value for the math. Yep, okay, so do your normal lighting you know, calculations and all the math there, um, and then just stretch uh, the, the color space after. Makes sense. Uh, we can convert uh, between these color spaces in a sh uh, shader with the code below. Okay, so shaders, for those who don't know, are the tiny little programs that you write uh, to do uh, various geometry processing, transformations, and pixel processing, okay? Um, amongst other things, but okay. So yeah, this is like the magic gamma value. Sometimes I'll see folks just like square the color, um, but here's gamma and then here's like undoing it. Yeah, so these little like helper functions, linear to, R, uh, to sRGB, standard RGB, and then the conversion back. Okay, and it's a power function. Yeah, so it gets that that's how we kind of grow this with this exponential function here. Makes sense. Uh, so let's take a look at some math to see how light and color interact with this approach. Okay, so here's some of our features of the light. Um, I guess just in grayscale. Like here's some color or texture map, the light. Do this stuff in linear, uh, normal, simple lighting. Uh, and then we do the conversion. Uh, let's see here, sRGB to linear, sRGB to linear. Uh, and then we go linear to sRGB. Okay, so you could convert back and forth, I guess. That's all it's showing here. Uh, the output of this program shows that converting from sRGB to linear and back results in lighting that doesn't get smashed by the albedo color. Simple lighting in the sRGB. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you can see that this values from a scale of zero to one, right? It's sliding things along the number line um, to, to balance it more out here. Uh, what this technique basically does is it reallocates precision away from the bright colors, which we do not uh, have as accurate perception of, and gives it to the dark colors, which we can see more easily. Yeah, I like that. That's a nice summary of what this is doing here. With standard linear uh, color, a simple scene looks both dull and heavily contrasted. Yeah, let's look at the gradient first before we see the scene. Yeah, here, right, you can delineate lots of different colors, the darks. But if we go on the linear scale, yeah, once I'm about here, right, all these white pixels um, are about the same intensity to me, right? So I lose that um, coloring here. Let's see if there's an image comparing this. Okay, so here's, uh, let's see here. Let's zoom out a little bit. Uh, okay, yeah, let's see, can we tell a difference? This looks like the crushed black and then this one's a little bit more interesting colors, right? The different sides of the faces and so on, okay. Let's zoom in and see. Uh, what's the word? What's the verdict here? Up oh, here we are. The same scene comes to life um, when colors are converted from sRGB to linear before lighting and then transformed back for the final color. We can clearly see a blue tint from the PBR, a physically based uh, rendering environment map, mixed with the orange color, and dark gray colors have much more definition now. I don't even understand how something can be blue and orange at the same time, but I can clearly see a blue reflection from the sky. Uh, in the image below. Yeah, here. so here's like the crushed colors and here's the, yeah, you are getting like a little bit of a tint here. Okay. Uh, this operation doesn't change the colors, it just changes the way the colors combine. Overall, this makes it easier for lights to illuminate dark areas without requiring extremely bright lights with strong contrast and the physical base rendering and lighting is more strongly visible in colored objects. This update is available now on the beta branch 
uh, and the standalone and Steam version of the Ultra Engine. Okay, cool. So this is a feature that uh, you know, they learned about and applied in their uh, game engine. I guess it just costs a little bit of computation to do this, right? The, the little conversion at the end. Uh, let's see, I used Lua code to create the gradient images. Okay, so how to, how to write those little pixel maps. Hope this explanation helps you understand what sRGB and linear color spaces actually do and how this feature makes your games look better. It's actually a very straightforward concept that for some reason is poorly explained in most articles I've seen. Uh, just remember linear is the squished color for math and sRGB is the stretch color. Uh, that's easier to see. sRGB, ah, okay, yeah, not standard, but stretched RGB, a better name for it. Okay, cool. Nice article. Very cool. Uh, and folks agreed in the comments there. I'll link to it uh, so you can read it yourself and take a look at these images. Um, but yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, and that's a nice way. I always thought of gamma correction as sort of this magic um, value that you apply. Uh, but it is nice, again, to think about it as this stretching your color space so that you can see um, you know, more contrast between the colors, giving more emphasis to the dark pixels, which you want to contrast. Because yeah, if something's dark, you just can't see it. I wonder if that's something related to how many, um, like the rods and cones in our actual eyes and how they perceive colors. But uh, that's another discussion, maybe another article here. Uh, and we're you know at about time. So. so anyways, folks, with that said, hope you enjoyed the news article. Hope you enjoyed the channel updates, uh, the training, the courses. Don't forget about those, the live stream. And let me know in your discussions below what you think. Um, and I'll be really curious to hear your feedback. And hopefully I'll see you live uh, sometime soon in one of these uh, videos here. We'll go through an article. We'll have a little bit of uh, updates and fun. And I'll look forward to joining you. So again, thanks as always for your support. And again, a special thank you to our longtime subscribers. And some of our members for this channel have now just crossed over two years, which is awesome. So uh, I want to celebrate and thank them again for their support. All right, folks, with that said, I'll look forward to seeing you in the next one.